The Speaker, Corey Johnson, will be up to vote. Minority Leader Stephen Matteo, Council Member Adrian Adams, Council, well, Council Member Margaret Chin is at another meeting. She'll be in. Excuse Palace. Hmm? Oh, uh, she's here. Um, <clears throat> Keith Powers is he's not. He's here somewhere. Council Member Deborah Rose and Council Member Mark Traeger, he's, he's not here yet. And Council Member Paul Vallone, who is not here yet. <clears throat> I would also like to acknowledge Rules Committee Council. I'm not going to say his last name. He's going <laughs> to say his last name because they always get it wrong. Lance? Pollavy. Pollavy. Okay. And the staff members of the Council's Investigative Unit, Chuck Davis, Chief Compliant Officer, and investigators, Andre Johnson Brown, Alicia. Vassell, Desiree Robinson, and Ramses Booten. We will consider the nomination of Julio Mendina for appointment to the Board of Corrections, Jenny Lowe for New York County Democratic Commissioner of Elections, Herman Merritt for the Civilian Complaint Review Board, Simone, Simona Quine for the Board of Health and Patricia Marthone for the Board of, of the Health and Hospitals Corporation. <clears throat> Should Mr. Medina be appointed by the council, he will be eligible to serve the remainder of a six-year term that expires on October 12th. 2026. I need my glasses. Should Miss Lowe be appointed? <coughs> by the council, she will be appointed to a four-year term that began on January 1st, <clears throat> 2021, and expires on December 31st, 2024. <clears throat> Should Ms. Merritt be appointed by the council, he will be eligible to serve for the remainder of the three-year term that expires on July 4th, 2023. Should Dr. Horn receive the advice and consent of the council, she will serve for the remainder of a six-year term that expires on May 31st, 2022. Should Ms. Marth Marthorn receive M-U-D-R. No, received, the, I lost my place. Received the designation by the council and subsequent appointment by the mayor. She will serve the remainder of a five-year term that will expire on March 20th, 2023. Chuck Davis, our chief compliance office, Officer has briefed all members of this committee regarding the contents of each candidate's background investigation. The first topic will be the Board of Elections. The Board of Elections consists of 10 commissioners, two from each of the city's five counties. Each commissioner serves a term of four years or until a successor is appointed. Commissioners shall be registered voters in the county for which they are appointed and registered 
as a member of the political party for which they are nominated. <clears throat> appointment of commissioners. The New York County Democratic Committee submitted a valid certificate of party recommendations on August 25th, 2021. If the council as a whole does not act within 30 days of receiving a, va a valid certificate of recommendation, the applicant political, the applicable, applicable political party conference within the council becomes empowered to approve the recommendation on its own. The BOE functions, the board and it, its commissioners are responsible for the maintenance and administration of voting records and elections. The board also exercises quasi-judicial powers by conducting hearings to validate nominating petitions of candidates for nomination to elective office. The board is required to make an annual report of its affairs and proceedings to the council. Compensation. Commissioners receive a $300 per diem for each day's attendance at meetings of the board or any of its committees with a maximum of $30,000 per year. <clears throat> Commissioners receive a $300 per diem for each day's attendance at meetings of the board or any of its committees with a maximum of $30,000 per year. <clears throat> the City Council sought advice from the New York City Law Department, Board of Elections, and Conflicts of Interest board regarding whether Ms. Lowe could have simultaneously as a BOE commissioner and city council employee. All three bodies returned opinion, returned opinions that there were no conflicts or compatibility of office issues that, were, <clears throat> that would prohibit her appointment to this position. If appointed Ms. Lowe, would fill a vacancy and serve the remainder, remainder of a four-year term that expires on December 31st, 2024. Welcome, Ms. Law Lowe. Would you please raise your right hand to be sworn in? Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Would you like to make an opening statement? Yes, yes, sir. Good morning, Chair Kosselowitz and members of the Rules, Privilege, and <coughs> Elections Committee. Thank you for allowing me to come before you today. I'm Jenny Lowe, and I've been nominated by the New York County Democratic Committee to serve as a New York City Board of Elections Commissioner. As an active voter and a former district leader, I've dealt with the BOE and the cumbersome silos for nearly 30 years. I've complained about the lack of language access, insufficient bilingual workers at the post site to help voters, the lack of outreach and leadership to immigrant and low-income communities to plan and communicate changes like the ranked choice voting. In order for the public to have confidence in any election, accurate counting and timely publishing of results are critical. BOE's weaknesses has been flawed implementation of new initiatives. This weakness led to many errors, including incorrect printing of absentee ballots, ranked choice voting implementation, and counting. If I'm appointed as a commissioner, I will have a chance to help fix some of these problems from the inside. And I have the experience and the skills to do that. I have a career of proven track records in leading organizational changes by listening, seeking input from stakeholders, collectively identifying solutions, and implementing them with stakeholder buy-in. Here at the council, I managed 
the administrative services and community okay. engagement okay. divisions. Okay. Prior to coming to the council, I had a career of process improvement, managing departmental operations at J.P. Morgan Chase. As a district leader mm -hmm. for 25 years and a former candidate, the B OE would gain someone with hands-on experience in the election process. We should take the upcoming off year to adequately plan, utilize best practices, and adjust the weaknesses at BOE. Finally, success requires strong leadership from someone who has gone through multiple elections and can work well with others to fix what's broken. Our democracy depends on easy voter access and timely and accurate vote counting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have uh, two questions. The New York City Board of Elections became a national embarrassment during this year's primary election after releasing an inaccurate preliminary tabulation of ranked choice votes based on staff error. What steps do you think the BOE should take to ensure the board does not make these mistakes in the future? So as a practitioner of process improvement, I know that there's always ways to improve a process. What I believe the Board of Election needs to do is double down on quality control steps um, not just about vote counting and tabulation and canvassing, but in every step of the process that they face with, uh, that handle, administer the elections. Okay. If confirmed, what steps would you take to help improve the implementation of ranked choice voting? As I mentioned earlier, um, the Board of Elections have not done an adequate job of educating voters, and particularly the voters who are in low-income and immigrant communities and those who don't have access to the Internet. So one of the first things that we need to do in order for ranked choice voting to fully um, allow voters to exercise their right to vote is to improve on the education and outreach by engaging community-based organizations, just like what they did with census, right? We did a great job with census, and we can do the same with educating voters at ranked choice voting, which I believe I support uh, as a way for us to conduct elections moving forward. Thank you. I'm going to now turn it over to Lance to continue asking questions because my allergies are really bad today and I have a hard time with the mask Lance? and talking. I do have a question. You would like to? Yes. Thank you, Chair Kozlowitz. We, the committee will now recognize council members who wish to ask the candidate questions. We'll begin with members of the Rules Committee followed by any other council members who wish to speak. Questioning will begin with Councilmember Adams, followed by Councilmember Traeger. Thank you so much. Good morning, Ms. Lowe. It is wonderful to see you back in these chambers, I must say. Um, the chair just raised significant questions regarding ranked choice voting, so I won't revisit that. But in 2020, thousands of voters in Kings County received incorrect absentee ballots, which was a grave issue uh, for that area and really for the entire city. So what steps would you take to prevent this type of error in future elections? So effective process and efficient process is very important in any uh, kind of work, especially in election, because in order for the public to trust our election process, we need to have very um, closely monitor quality improvement and quality control in place and test it before implementation. That goes for not just the Board of Election employees and staff, but vendors that the Board of Election engages. 
we need to look at what is currently in place with respect to contracts and accountability. And that we have to demand the utmost high quality control with every vendor that we engage in. And should I be appointed as commissioner, I will make sure that we begin, if, not, if that has not already began, a process of re reviewing all the vendors that provide services for the Board of Elections. Okay, thank you. Uh, I may actually revisit a question for ranked choice voting. I've got another question to ask you. We see uh, at many of our polling sites that lines continue to be very, very long, um, particularly over the last few elections. Uh, there really hasn't been that much improvement over um, this issue at many New York City polling places. So what can the Board of Elections do to expand early voting hours sites and capacity at existing sites? Uh, as someone who have waited online in 2020 for hours, so I understand uh, how it feels and I understand how frustrating it is for voters. Um, in order for us to improve uh, and increase particip voter participation, we need to look at all of uh, what you just described, which is uh, in particular, in early <coughs> voting sites, we need to look at hours of operation and ease of voting as in looking at beyond just um, assembly district, election district by assignment to post sites, uh, early voting post sites. We need to look at what is called universal voting center that have been implemented in other jurisdictions. We need to go learn and how that works. And finally, we have to make sure that we train the staff properly and have the proper equipment and technology to be able to handle that. And that is a way for us to, uh, among other things, to reduce the wait time for voters to vote. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have one more question, and it, it, uh, it'll just go back a little bit uh, to the ranked choice voting issue. We had the Board of Elections, this council had the Board of Elections in several hearings, uh, oversight hearings, prior to the implementation of ranked choice voting in the city. And uh, for the most part, the questions that were answered were answered in the positive for the most part. And the BOE representation seemed to double down in a lot of cases uh, in, in assuring this council that the implementation was going well, that the education was going well, that the, uh, the structures would be up to par and completed and approved um, in compliance. And we know now that that didn't happen. You mentioned in your uh, statement the need for language access, which m my District 28 in Southeast Queens is one of the most diverse uh, districts in the city. And I can personally uh, concur with you that there is an, an extreme language barrier and it presents a tremendous issue for voters across this city. So can you just tell us one more time how you would, in given the light of this era of ranked choice voting in particular, what changes you would wanna make or what difference can you, coming into the Board of Elections, make to penetrate the issue of language access for voters? So, as a teenager, I used to, this, uh, before language access was available, I used to go with my grandmother to vote and interpret for her. So I have faced that all my life since, um, and language access is most important. Currently, the law requires the Board of Elections to have four languages uh, uh, access. But there are many other languages that needs interpretation. Many voters whose language, first language, native language is not English. They need help. And uh, a year or two ago, uh, Board of, uh, the council voted and allocated funding to, uh, for additional interpreters to be placed on the, uh, to, to help I, I believe we should welcome that and seek the help and welcome the help of these additional translator interpreters in languages 
that are mostly most spoken in the district where they where they need. So that is one way. And um, I also believe that we need to really uh, look at training of poll workers, especially those who will be interpreting, who speak another language, and look at far and wide to recruit those who speak more than one language in the community where, they, where these languages are spoken. Okay, thank you very much for your testimony today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Adams. We will now hear from Councilmember Traeger, followed by Councilmember Chen. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Kosowitz, and uh, thank you, Ms. Lowe, for, for being here today and to answer, answer questions. And to, just to build on my colleague's question, the issue of language access is very personal for me. Um, being, I believe, the only Russian-speaking official, city official in New York, and as someone who has fought for a number of years for language access, not just for the Russian-speaking community, but folks who speak also Haitian uh, Creole, folks that speak Arabic uh, and other languages in Brooklyn and other across parts of the city. The Board of Elections has historically moved the, the goalpost in terms of why they felt they, they couldn't do it. Uh, first, I was told years ago it was a money issue, and then we in the city council acted. We said, how much do you need? And I do want to give credit to the former speaker, Melissa Marco and the current speaker, Corey Johnson, for both committing resources to tackle this issue. And then the excuse shifted again. Well, technically, only the state could require us to do this, and that's why the city had to create its own language access program to hire interpreters, and they were forced to sit outside of poll sites in the rain. In the cold rain, they were forced to sit outside, but they stayed to help voters. Questions such as, what is an ED? Where is my table? Because people, their first entry point is the information desk, and that's not where many interpreters are. And I was called to help troubleshoot many times. So this is, issue is very personal for me, because many people historically have been turned away. And then we complain about turnout uh, not being as high. So I think the roles of commissioners are that much more important to make sure that we help tackle this equity issue within the Board of Elections. There's more work to do in Albany. There's, we need to continue to support in the city. In the city. But can you ensure that that commitment, and I, I, I liked your answer to Councilmember Adams, but to, to double down on that commitment that we internalize this and not to have separate and disjointed processes for language access, but to actually have a one uniform language access program with interpreters to all communities that need it in all zip codes, in all parts of the city. I very much appreciate your answer to this. Uh, yes, Councilmember Traeger, like <coughs> you, um, my first language is not English. So I understand, and I, I lived in the community where many voters whose first language is not English. So as a kid, before I was even eligible to vote, I was helping to register voters to vote, convincing them why voting is important, and then helping them make sure that they go to vote and have access. You know, one thing that, um, I have not mentioned uh, is um, when we have people working at the post site and training them besides the technical skill, knowing how to use and all of that, right besides that, one very important element is customer service. I'm sure I don't, we don't need to go over what, what, what that means, but um, we need to incorporate that into the customer service mentality because we, as the poll worker, we are there to serve the voters. They are the customer. So, like you say, if they need a language, we need to first do a good job in recruiting folks who can speak the language to speak. Whether or not, yes, there's state requirement, as long as we're not violating the state election law, having additional, uh, having poll workers who speak additional languages other than the four required language, I think is a no-brainer. But we need to do a better job in recruiting. And in my opinion, someone who has worked in the community for many, many years, that you need to work with local community organizations who have the trust of the people and the voters. 
and recruit from there to help. There are other ways to recruit poll workers, and, and I, as a new, new person coming in, if I should be uh, um, uh, appointed, I want to look at all options to recruit people to be able to better serve the voter. I hope I answered your question. I, and, 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 and you did, and uh, I, I appreciate uh, th that answer and your dedication. I would just close by saying that the Board of Elections, you know, says that when poll workers are hired, uh, you know, they can, they're hired, they could be speak any language. I always tell them that you should not only rely on the poll workers to do that because their job is to staff the table to make sure that they're protecting the integrity of the election process as well. And it's not fair to them to be pulled away from the table back and forth to help address other, there are dedicated staff just for language access, and that's what's needed. Uh, and not to have pull, pull people around back and forth throughout the day. But I appreciate your support, your commitment, and your service. And I congratulate you. Thank you very much, Chair, for your time. Thank you. We'll now hear from Councilmember Chin, followed by Councilmember Rose. Hello? Yeah. Hi, Jenny. Congratulations Hi. on your nomination. I know that you have, you know, worked so many years as district leader. You know all the problems that exist at the polling site. One of the issues that I want to raise up is that with Board of a Election, it's really how do they help allow more people access to voting? I mean, the whole concept of early voting was great, but across the district, like in, in my district, there were not sites that were available um, to neighborhood. It was like, like there was no site in Chinatown. There was no site in the financial district. You gotta go and take the subway or you gotta take a bus to get to the polling site. So I think going forward, I wanna see how you plan on in terms of working with other commissioners to make sure that this early voting process it's really accessible to all, and to be able to identify more polling sites. And also look at, you know, sites where people, centralized sites where people, like in the, in the commercial area where people work, make it easy for people to vote. And I think going forward, that, that's something that the, the Board of Elections should really focus on, making this access available, and make it as easy as possible um, as my colleague mentioned about language access, but even just physical, making sure that there are sites available all over the city and not be restricted by, you know, where you live or your ED or your things like that. So how do you have some idea in terms of how to really make that possible? Yes, Council Member Jen, I, uh, I remember because we live in the same district. The first year we have early voting, you remember, we only have one voting site that in lower Manhattan, uh, early voting site, yes. We, in terms of helping to increase participation and reduce the lines for early voting, we need to look for more sites. That's one, um, one uh, way to, to help that. And secondly, is to be, uh, to, we need to seriously explore and find ways to make universal wo voting centers happen and start with early voting because you do have many days to do that. And that requires dedication of equipment uh, and training of staff and also collaborating with community organizations to find the location that would be convenient for voters. And so, um, as I mentioned earlier, being able to vote easily and conveniently is very important in, um, in helping us increase participation for voters. And particularly, making sure that these vote sites, not only they're required by law to be accessible, but really have to make it easily accessible not just say, say checking the box for accessibility, so for the people in the um, disability community. And also the, um, what I understand is that uh, many people have talked about it, the ballot marking devices that we currently use are very old and they are not able to accommodate the complication of the ballots that we have today and also the language that's required. So 
um, we need to seriously look at that and, and look at technology that can help us do that. Yeah, I, going forward, I really have high hopes that the, the Board of Election will modernize, really utilizing you know, computer technology. It really doesn't make sense why someone have to only vote at a certain polling site. So I think you know, getting more access to voter will be a, an important thing to do. So I look forward to working with you, and hopefully uh, you'll be able to work with the other commissioner and, and improve the Board of Election. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Chair. you. Thank you, Councilmember Chin. We'll now have questions from Councilmember Rose. Thank you. It's always dangerous for me to follow Councilmember Chin because um, we've been together so long, we kind of think the same. Um, so I, I want to um, piggyback on, um, on the early voting uh, polling sites. Um, one of the issues that I have is, um, is that, again, is the location. Uh, they are not located in the neighborhoods where people, um, you know, traditionally vote. And it causes a great deal of confusion. Um, on early election, um, early, early voting um, election days, um, I am flooded with calls. Uh, where do we vote? Um, the Board of Elections uh, has to do a better job of, of educating um, voters about, you know, the, dis the difference uh, in the polling sites. And as a result, people don't vote because they are not aware of, you know, of where these sites are because they're different from their traditional voting um, sites. So um, I'd, I'd really like to know, um, I find this is a breakdown in the Board of Elections across the board. Uh, we saw it with ranked choice voting. We were assured that you know, the, the public would be educated to what that process was. And it was almost you know, several weeks out from the election before if people were really um, advised how ranked choice voting worked. Um, and so it's the same with these early polling sites. Um, what can you do to ensure that people know the difference and that you know, these sites are in, in their communities so that they can get there? Um, thank you, Councilmember Rose. I agree with you 100 percent that all of these issues that you mentioned uh, uh, have been problematic for voters. And um, I was, uh, so I say that with vote post site locations, whether they are early vote sites or they're traditional vote sites, the, we must make sure that we have consistent places where people will go to vote whether it's an early voting site or their, their regular voting site. They have to, the Board of Elections has to do a much better job in communicating with the voters early. As I mentioned uh, early in my opening remark that the lack and insufficient outreach to communities, and especially in low-income and immigrant community where access to the internet is very limited, we, the Board of election needs to change the way they operate and communicate with community that are not used to getting on the, the, the portal, the website to look for things, is to work with local community organizations and work with them consistently to help voters understand and know what's going on. Ranked choice voting, in my opinion, there was if there was any education at all, was click on the, go the website. There was no in-person, no effort in my, that I have seen to help voters understand, and I think that has to change, mm -hmm. and we need to use this next cycle, which is not ranked choice, right, <laughs> right. to go out and educate voters right. and help them understand what ranked choice voter means and how, mm -hmm. them can, how they can fully exercise their right to be able to use all of the choices that they have 
to if vote. You're, if, if you're appointed to um, the Board of Elections, Jenny, um, uh, will you become an active advocate about education in terms of every time there's a new initiative, a new machine, a new process, it doesn't matter what it is. The education of the, of the public is woefully inadequate and it creates um, systemic issues that, or it elucidates the systemic issues that VOE just can't seem to get ahead of. And, and most of that is because of the, the fact that the voters are not educated. They don't know what, what to expect, what the process is, how to walk through it. And so um, there needs to be adequate funds put, you know, uh, dedicated for educating the voting public about whatever the changes are, whatever the new initiatives are, whatever. And we need somebody to actively not only advocate, but see that this is something that's followed through. And also, I'd like to ask your idea of, about universal voting centers, where we're trying not to disenfranchise voters, we're trying to encourage them. If we made it easy where you could go to any voting site and, and cast your vote, um, I, I think the numbers that we would see on election day would, um, would be far greater than what we experience now. So what, um, what are your, what's your feeling about universal voting centers and about moving this from a concept to uh, making it sort of a reality, something that the board's really going to consider? Um, thank you, Council Member Rose, for your uh, questions. Um, so I'll address the, the first part of your questions, which has to do with voter education. So I was the first Asian American elected as a district leader in New York City. So I served in that capacity from 1995 to 2021. So as a district leader and from an immigrant community and a minority, I spent all of that, my time as district leader, even before that, helping voters go vote and educating them. So I share your frustration and about the lack of voter education and the plans to do that ahead of any changes at the Board of Elections. So I share that frustration. So will I be committed to doing, changing that? Absolutely yes. And I will do whatever I can as a new commissioner to convince the Board of Elections that they have to change and they have to really help voters focus on helping them vote easily, and that includes education prior to, to any changes. Uh, with respect to universal voting centers, um, you know, we need to go, it's, yes, it's a concept, and it's done in other places. We should go and look at um, other jurisdictions that are of comparable size, like Los Angeles. I understand that they have universal voting centers. We need to learn what they do. If it's a technology issue, could we build, ask them and say, this is what we need in order to work and have that built for us? Is it possible to do that? Is it possible for us to start piloting it in by county first, using early vote sites to early voting time to do the universal uh, piloting? I think one of the things, as I mentioned earlier, is that the Board of Election had had trouble implementing new initiatives, right? It's flawed, there's errors. I believe we need to be able to find a better way to implement new processes. In my career of well, many years, of process improvement, I believe we need to test out new processes and pilot them before you roll it out to the big, uh, the ent big um, entire, um, area of whatever you need to open. So I, I hope that helps answer your question. I believe um, voting center is what we really need to seriously look at it and start planning for it. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. 
Thank you, Councilmember Rose. We now recognize the speaker. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning. Thank you all for being here. It's such a great group of nominees to serve our city. Uh, good to see you, Herman. I'm glad you're being nominated for the CCRB. I have a question uh, for uh, Ms. Lowe. Uh, Jenny, thanks for being here today at this hearing. You know, there has been over many years, and you have been district leader during all these years, you've seen time and again a dysfunction at the Board of Elections over and over and over again, whether it be on the lead up to election day or election day itself or the night of the election or the days following the election. And there has been talk and conversation in Albany, and there's been a bill that's been around for a while, which would uh, professionalize the Board of Elections, which would say the current system the way it is doesn't work, and the only way to change that is through state legislation. I believe uh, Senator Kruger uh, has a bill, and I think uh, Sen Senator Myrie, who chairs the committee, has said he's interested in looking at that bill on changing how the Board of Elections structure exists in New York City to have more accountability, to have uh, a better, more responsive uh, Board of Elections for New York City voters. Is that something you would be supportive, supportive of, looking at that bill and, and figuring out a way, even though you're joining the system as it exists, but looking at a way to really transform the system and make real changes in the future for elections in New York City. Um, uh, thank you, Speaker Johnson. I, I share with you the sentiment of what you have mentioned about the dysfunction and, and that, frankly, the Board of Elections in New York City is the laughing stock of the country. We're one of the biggest ones, but we can't seem to get things right, right? As an outside observer, I share that frustration with you. Yes, I am joining, um, if I'm a po uh, appointed, uh, a 10 commissioner board. We can't continue to function like it is today. So yes, I will support, I am open to explore ways to change this culture, the function, the structure, the way we conduct elections in New York City. That may include changing the personnel structure, but I think among the most important thing is really training folks, staff, um, finding new ways to find poll workers because you do, right, we do have like, tens of thousands of poll workers that we need to have in place on election day. So yes, professionalize whatever that means, right, is the most important thing is to not only staff and poll workers have the uh, skills and um, techno uh, skills and uh, experience to conduct the election, but also with a focus, change the focus on customer service to voters. And if you call that professionalizing, yes, I'm all for it. And I you hope would I be, answer your question. Thank you. And, and you would be open to, uh, I know the, the, the Board of Elections can't do it itself and the City Council doesn't have statutory authority, but you would be open to exploring how to completely change the structure of the Board of Elections. Right now you have you know, five Democratic commissioners, five Republican commissioners, and it's not really probably the way to get things done. Um, and there are different proposals on what that should be, but you would be open to that conversation and looking at changes in the structure of the Board of Elections. Yes, absolutely. Thank I you. Be, I look forward to talking to Senator Kruger and Senator Marley. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Are there any other? Oh, Councilmember Powers. Hi there, and again, Ms. Lowe, congratulations on your nomination, and uh, nice to see you again. Uh, my, Councilmember Chin had touched on this a little bit, but it's an issue that is, I know you know, affects Manhattan so much, which is the early voting sites and the lack of available sites to uh, accommodate uh, 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 so many people want to go vote. We had, a rec we had a very high turnout last year, and of course we had the presidential election the year before that, and in my district they had to, or in the Upper East Side, they had to open up an emergency site a few years ago, two years ago, because of the long lines and waiting times. And it feels, 
and, and, and recently in response to that, we, we had the Metropolitan Museum of Art become a, a polling place, an early voting place, and we're looking for more. I know you touched upon this a little bit, but I wanted to just go back to it because we're in such dire need in, in, in down here in Lower Manhattan and all the way through the borough. Do you, can you outline some areas? So we, we've talked about cultural institutions as one place that there might even be an obligation under, I think, city law for them to be served as a uh, polling place. But you, can you talk about other places, other types of institutions that you might feel or other, other ways that we could expand on early voting, particularly in Manhattan, when, and, and to relieve the stress on some of the sites that leads to long waits and then leads to, of course, people being discouraged when they go to vote? Uh, Yes, um, what I understand is that um, there are existing um, laws governing certain um, entities that they have obligation to provide space for election, whether it's early voting or on election day. I, what I understand uh, is that we may, the board currently, or have, for whatever reason, have not been able to um, fully enforce that uh, obligation on entities that um, that are required to to do so, and I think we need to explore that. There are many places that I believe, for example, public uh, buildings and uh, besides schools, right? We're all familiar with schools, but they are nonprofit organizations that also may have space, and they um, are obligated to uh, allow elections to be conducted in their location. So I think we. Um, we need, the board needs to really do a better job and also perhaps need, talk to local elected officials like council members, right? Because you know your, your district well, you know the organizations and the entity well, is to work with folks like you to say, hey, you know, we are looking to such and such a location in your neighborhood, in your district, can you help us get that as a location to benefit your voters, right? And that, that's one thing that I, I, would, I think we, we, the board can do better. Well, and one of the areas I would mention is that last piece, which is in the, some experience with the Board of Elections, when they have come to my office to look for locations, we've been able to help them or put a little bit of pressure on somewhere to serve. I mentioned our public library system. New York Public Library is one of the only systems that sees that does not serve as uh, I know they're probably going to yell at me when I for saying this, but they don't serve as polling places across the board. I think there's other area, places like there where we'd be looking. Um, I know Councilmember Adams, I think, asked a little bit about ranked choice voting earlier. I want to just pick up on that. It's something I think we'll be discussing in the wake of these elections about what worked, what didn't work. You uniquely uh, understand that system, having gone through it this year, and, and many of us, I think, have uh, opinions on the strengths and weaknesses of the program, but so we'll be discussing that and I think you've shared some thoughts on that and, and certainly interested in hearing more, but are there other, as we discuss the, the sort of the, after these elections next year, uh, uh, we talk about ranked choice voting, are there other items you would like to see the city council take up or even I suppose the state legislature pick up in terms of making voting better, easier, different, other ways to make the voting experience better and increased turnout here in the city? Um, well, one thing that uh, have been talked about is um, how do we find more readily available poll workers on election day? And there's been talk about asking municipal or state workers to make that as part of their responsibility and other jurisdictions in the country have done that. So should that become serious conversation, I believe we need this council support to, uh, uh, I say we, the Board of Elections need to have the council support, not, uh, in addition to the mayor's support, to be, to, to be able to make that happen. I, I think uh, if you look at um, election day poll workers, they all just come in one day and then they, they go. And, it's, um, it's not consistent, right? There are a set of people who, are, who, who work that day, but that may be something, and, and maybe I am like really out there thinking about this, but as a newbie, I think I, think I, I would like us to explore all options and learn from other jurisdictions that have done it, a decent job and a good job in uh, running election day, specifically about election day operations. Okay, thanks. My final question, if you could enact any single change right now with the wave of a wand 
to our election system, what would that be? Uh, I'm sorry. I if you could enact any single change, you had the, the sort of authority to enact any single change here in our elections here in New York City to make a, to improve our elections, what would that reform be? Um, I would say that we need to develop and tr properly train everyone, staff at the Board of Elections, and including poll workers, and exploring ways to be able to, and shift our mentality. And I don't want to uh, say this uh, on the record as our current staff and poll workers are not good. I'm not saying that, but I think if we, um, but it's inconsistent everywhere. So I think in any place for, for any system, any op operation process to work well, the people are the most critical element of that process. And when we are able to train and recruit folks who, who have the passion to do the work, that shows. And when we, as workers or staff at the Board of Election, we're there to serve the voters. So we need to be able to have the voters feel that we're there to serve them and that we need to be able to help make it as easy as possible. So I would say training and development of staff and second with technology and equipment. Okay, thank you. Thanks to Chair Kozlowitz for the time. Thank you, Council Member Powers, and thank you, Ms. Lowe. We'll now move on to our candidates for the Board of Correction and the CCRB. The New York City Department of Correction provides for the care, custody, and control of persons accused or convicted of crimes and sentenced to one year or less of jail time. By law, the Board of Correction, or BOC, shall have the power and duty to inspect and visit all institutions and facilities under the jurisdiction of the department at any time, evaluate the department's performance, establish minimum standards for the care, custody, correction, treatment, supervision, and discipline of all persons held or confined under the jurisdiction of the department, and establish procedures for the hearing of grievances and complaints. The Board of Correction is composed of nine members. Three members are appointed by the mayor, three by the council, and three by the mayor on the nomination of the presiding justices of the appellate division of the Supreme Court for the first and second judicial departments. Members are appointed to six-year terms, and vacancies are filled for the remainder of an unexpired term. The mayor designates the chair of the Board of Correction from among its members. Although the board members receive no compensation, they may, however, be reimbursed for expenses incurred in the performance of their duties. Julio Medina is a candidate for appointment by the council to the Board of Correction. If Mr. Medina is appointed, he will fill a vacancy and serve for the remainder of a six-year term that expires on October 12th, 2026. Next, the Civilian Complaint Review Board shall consist of 15 members of the public. Members shall be residents of the City of New York and shall reflect the diversity of the city's population. The members of the board shall be appointed as follows. First, five members one from each of the five boroughs shall be appointed by the city council. One member shall be appointed by the public advocate. Three members with experience as law enforcement professionals shall be designated by the police commissioner and appointed by the mayor. Five members shall be appointed by the mayor. And finally, one member shall be appointed jointly by the mayor and the speaker of the council to serve as chair of the board. Herman Merritt, a resident of Kings County, is a candidate for appointment by the council to the CCRB. If appointed, Mr. Merritt will succeed Marbury Stolly Butts and will be eligible to serve for the remainder of a three-year term that expires on July 4th, 2023. Welcome Mr. Medina and Mr. Merritt. Would you please raise your right hand to be sworn in? Do you both swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. I do. Okay, Mr. Medina, do you wish to make an opening statement? Yes, I do. Please go ahead. Good morning and thank you to the committee chair and members of New York City Council for allowing me the opportunity to be heard in this forum. 
My name is Julio Medina. I'm a native of New York and a proud Bronx resident. I'm the founding chief executive officer of Exodus Transitional Community, and I'm a candidate for appointment for the New York City Board of Correction. Engaging in this, in this New York City Board of Correction appointment, as somebody impacted by the justice system, sometimes feels surreal. Yet I've come to realize that my personal experience, coupled with my education and professional experience, makes me a strong candidate worthy of consideration. These combined experiences guide me as I work to identify opportunities for change within individuals, communities, and systems. Regardless of the outcome, it has been an honor and a privilege to be considered for this appointment. As I mentioned, I am the founding CEO of Exodus Transition Committee. Since opening our doors in 1999, we served over 25,000 individuals impacted by the legal system. Each day, I witness firsthand the way over incarceration ravages under-resourced under communities comprised of black, indigenous, and people of color. Our current systems strain already fragile family and community dynamics, inflicting additional trauma. I am proud of the strides uh, for what we've made as a city to lessen our confinement footprint. I am hopeful as we work towards closing Rikers in favor of smaller, safer community borough-based jails while recognizing there is still so much agent, a, urgent work to be done. At Exodus, I now have over 30 staff members working on Rikers Island daily. I visited Rikers Island on Tuesday. Um, Exodus is facilitating group services on Rikers Island, working with people to obtain employment upon release. Um, as I said earlier this week, I visit Rikers with my staff. Like most people, uh, we've been following the tragic reports in the news. Lives are still being unnecessarily lost on Rikers Island. Understaffed correction officers are working double, triple shifts. The number of incidents of violence are on the rise. The atmosphere weighed tense and heavy. One thing was extremely clear that change is necessary. I believe that as a person with lived experience, a nonprofit leader dedicated to serving individuals impacted by the legal system, an advocate for systematic change, a believer in personal transformation and a person committed to faith, I offer a unique perspective. I feel that my appointment will be a compliment and asset to the existing members of the New York City Board of Corrections. I appreciate your time and consideration of my candidacy for appointment. Thank you, Mr. Medina. Thank Mr. You. Merritt, would you like to make an opening statement now? Yes. <clears throat> Good morning, Chairwoman Kostowitz and esteemed members of the Committee on Rules, Privileges, and Elections. My name is Herman Merritt, and I'm being considered to be a member of the board, a board member of the Civilian Complaint Review Board. This process was a time for reflection for me. I am a first generation native New Yorker, born to migrant to Mississippi. My parents moved from the Deep South, trying to escape the segregation in Jim Crow that was legal when I was born. They did menial but honest work and raised me to try to help those who need assistance. That message was reinforced when I won a Martin Luther King scholarship to attend NYU. It was during the Vietnam War, and as a college student, I was part of the anti-war and civil rights movement. I dedicated myself to public service at this point. After college, I became a teacher and worked for the Department of Education for 36 years. I had the good fortune to teach in Harlem and Fort Greene before I became an assistant principal in East New York then finally, I was appointed a principal in Bedford-Stuyvesant. My years in public education were quite rewarding. I felt that teaching was one of the most noble things that you could do. You had the opportunity to nurture the hearts and minds of the youth and ultimately change society. My last six years at the DOE was as a mentor and an intervener in the supervisory support program. I received superior training and was exposed to emotional intelligence. I was enrolled in a program at Hunter College where I was trained to understand my EQ, emotional quotient, to help understand myself better and be sensitive to the emotional needs of others. I had the opportunity to work with a diverse group of supervisors assigned throughout the five boroughs. Visiting so many schools around the city, I was able to see the direction we are moving around the city, but instructive on what we need to do. When I left the school system, on one hand, I was dismayed because as a group, most of the districts where I worked were still considered failing districts. But examining the problem from afar, you can see, you see the successes that you had. Anecdotally, every educator can give you success stories and feel optimism for the future. The numbers may not show it, but we know that with the application of all the new research and changes in technology, 
we are on the verge of great progress. I feel this way about the CCRB, tasked with monitoring the behavior of law enforcement personnel in an era of poor community police relations. It is imperative that the CCRB continue to practice the motto of my former school district, we learn and we grow. It appears that the CCRB is focusing on continuous improvement. There are many programs, such as the Blake Fellows, the Youth Advisory Council that bring the energy of the interns and young people to bring to have input and life experience in the CCRB. Drawing a parallel to my life, I was an adult before I had the opportunity to interact with police officers. Public safety is probably the most essential need of New Yorkers. So many things decide what type of environment we live in, but the synergy of various agencies working together can make things better. It is important when the CCRB asked the NYPD to train officers on the difference between policing adults and policing youth, and to keep better data on school safety officers, since there is no independent oversight of SSOs. These are small steps, but these recommendations come directly from the Youth Advisory Council. I am humbled at the possibility of serving on the CCRB. I understand the difficulty of this task, but I'm prepared to use the skills learned in my career and the wisdom obtained from being a native New Yorker to further the mission of the CCRB. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. <clears throat> I will now ask you a few questions and then invite other members of the committee to ask questions. Mr. Medina, Rikers Island and the other D uh, Department of Corrections facilities in New York City are currently in crisis. The conditions are inhumane and there are mass staff shortages which have led to increasing deaths of incarcerated individuals. Yesterday, the 12th incarcerated individual died in DOC custody at the barge. If confirmed, what, what will you do to address these disturbing issues? You know, this is, this is a humanitarian crisis at the moment. As I mentioned, I was on Rikers Island on Tuesday um, when we're talking about addressing these issues, this is not something that happens uh, single-handedly. This is something that has to happen with all of us uh, being part of this process. I can't really uh, hear you. Can, oh. Can you? Can I, can I remove this? No? No. All right. Let me start this again. Any better? Yes, I believe so. All right. Thank you. Um, so to answer your question, um, I think some of the things that I would do is, is you know, we have the, first of all, uh, something has to happen with the union and try to get correction officers back to work. Uh, nowhere in the country can someone miss two months of work and three months of work, four months of work and still have a job. Um, so I think it's important that uh, those that can come back to work do come back to work. We also have to have some type of programmatic uh, uh, a plan to get programs back into the facilities. As I mentioned, I was in there uh, Tuesday, and and there's a lot of work that has to happen. I mean, from from food arriving on time to to cells that that, that still don't close, so so people can roam around and don't feel safe. Uh, again, to officers working uh, uh, double and triple shifts. Um, I think so. Some of those things just we have to immediately address. This is not something that that. Uh, should, you know, uh, politics should not get in the way of this. There are close to 6,000 people on Rikers Island that need help now. What steps would you take to increase vaccinations among corrections officers and individuals in DOC custody? You know, uh, vaccination is, you know, across the country, this has been a hot button topic. Uh, so it's, it's difficult to come up with one single plan. I think we just have to continue to encourage. There's, there's when you walk onto the island, there's vaccination sites right on there so, so officers can come on. Uh, we tried to provide incentives. Um, one officer said, you know, give me a week off or something and I'll think about it. I'm sure that was a joke. Um, 
but I think we have to become creative uh, on how we get officers vaccinated, just as we're doing with school teachers across the country as well. Okay. And Mr. Merritt, how do you think the CCRV can help to improve long-standing issues with policy and community relations? I think the CCRB has to be more, a little bit more decentralized in, in the sense of bringing their work into the communities. Uh, it's a lot to ask uh, citizens with a problem to come downtown to make a complaint. Uh, I think there needs to be a lot of outreach with, uh, and, you know, I'm a school veteran, and I think schools are such a central part of the community. I think, you know, through parent associations, parent meetings, and community, um, uh, community education councils, this information should be brought to the people in the community. Uh, the union where I worked, uh, CCRB did a presentation for our members uh, a few years ago. And uh, our members are principals and assistant principals. And a lot of them were not aware of all the things that the CCRB does. So it has to be a big outreach to inform people and get people to know that by working with the CCRB, by making complaints, things get better. Okay. I would now, <clears throat> I would now like to recognize any council members who wish to ask the candidate questions. We will begin with members of the committee, followed by any other council members who wish to speak. Council members signed up are council members Powers, Adams, Chin, Rose, Traeger, and Drum. We will start with council member Powers. Thank you and congratulations to everyone on your uh, uh, nominations today. Uh, Mr. Medina, I wanted to just ask you a few questions as the chair of the Criminal Justice Committee when it comes to the Board of Corrections in the mm -hmm. state of Rikers Island. Uh, council member Drum and I were there last week and I don't want to summarize his feelings on it, but I think it's fair to say we were quite horrified with what we saw, particularly in the intake units there and uh, in the clinic as well. I'm, so, I'm sure you saw those areas when you were there. Uh, the mayor has put out a plan with the Department of Corrections to address the conditions, the overcrowding, the safety issues, the staffing, medical conditions and clinics. Can you comment your thoughts on that plan? Are there changes you would make to that plan? Are there uh, weaknesses that you see in it? And, and, and where would you, as a member of the Board of Corrections, recommend changes to that, the plan that's been released over the last two weeks? Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure there'll be more items to it, but how, how would you, how would you, what would be your critique of that and, and how would you improve it or change it relative to what he's asking Sure, uh, 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 thank you. I think one of the things is, is let's, let's, all this should be couched when we're talking about, you know, uh, using NYP officers to, to, do, to bring some folk to court, let's couch all of this with a sense of urgency. I think um, I, you were there last week. I was there on Tuesday. I got debriefed yesterday. Um, just a sense of urgency that we have to make sure that we are all speaking at the same time. Twelve deaths on Rikers Island in the last nine months is fully unacceptable. I think the mayor's plan uh, in trying to get people moving, it's difficult moving, you know, you're mo we're moving 40 people, sentence people upstate to upstate facilities. It's difficult when someone has 13 days left uh, on their sentence, you know, to, to go upstate to try to figure out and navigate an upstate facility and come back. Um, so I, I would, some of the things I would do to, to, to basically uh, uh, try to make the, uh, the mayor's recommendations a little more effective is, is is maybe find different units to put folks in as opposed to moving them upstate facilities. I don't think that solves the problem. Uh, and I think just one of the things we have to do is get providers on Rikers Island. There is no one on Rikers Island right now. We need to get providers in there. We need folks in there to really begin to do some of the basic humanitarian work around getting people food. Thank you. And I agree on the population that's been transferred and folks that are facing a, mm -hmm. 
uh, a short sentence remaining. Uh, one of the questions in the uh, book here was about the uh, recently passed rules regarding solitary confinement and, and punitive segregation, really, in the city jails. And I, uh, uh, you said you do support the banning of solitary confinement in the city jails, something that I've also called for. And, and then uh, the replacement of the Board of Corrections, if you remember, what I had voted on and did rulemaking on was around the RMAS units, which we also saw last week. Um, and the question was, do you believe they end solitary confinement? And your answer is yes. Um, one of the criticisms that I think folks have had in the implementation of that is that while the rules themselves reflect a, de a desire to exit from the uh, old way of punitive segregation, that some of the units being utilized are still uh, one single unit with a long duration for an individual to be in those without uh, without recognizing all the other stuff pro, uh, that one might need while in custody. So I wanted to just ask just a follow-up question on your answer about the solitary confinement, which is, do you believe that the current implementation of RMS and solitary confinement? Do I believe? I'm sorry. The, the, the current implementation of the RMAS rulemaking and solitary confinement. Um, my personal feelings, there shouldn't be solitary confinement at all. So let me just give you my personal feelings around it. Um, I was in that facility. I am a person that's justice impacted. And the horrors that one faces when they, we call it the box in my days in SHU, is horrible. Sensory deprivation and all those other things that happen uh, do not make a good fit for a young person. With that said, um, I think there's alternatives that we can do. I mean, there was a lot of progress with what we w were able to do right now in limiting uh, terms of, of uh, solitary confinement. Can you hold the mic, just hold the microphone closer? Yeah. We're limiting terms of solitary confinement. Um, so there were some things that we were able to do that, that you know, I, uh, again, personally, I, I still think there's more we must do. But uh, to be in a space where we're in now, where we've definitely reduced uh, people's time in solitary confinement, I support, if that's the answer to your question. Okay, I, I, one of the units there is the uh, is at NIC, and yep. it's where they're hosted, and I, you know, um, that that's, I think there's concerns from folks that it's sort of keeping the, the old system in and implementation. I'll just move on to my last question here, which is just about staff working there today. We have the uniform staff and the uh, medical staff who are, um, I think it's fair to say overworked, understaffed, and facing a uh, public health crisis in COVID and of course a safety crisis often when it comes to uh, an understaffing and, and putting, and when we were there, we saw units that were woefully understaffed, in some cases didn't have staff at all or were being double sta you know, staffed two units at a time by, by one individual. Um, how does the Board of Corrections help the department or what are the steps that the department should be taking to look at how to address violence against staff and to ensure that when there's, uh, as we sort of take the sort of emergency steps here to address the crisis at Rikers Island, that we are also looking at the long-term use of force uh, that has gone up and has been criticized by the monitor, but also to look at the uh, 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 you know, attacks on folks that are working there and the safety issues that we heard from both uniform staff and nurses and doctors when we were there last week. Mm -hmm. um, I think as a, as a, a member of BOC, if, if, if that would have happened, I think just some of the things we have to do is, is, is just be very transparent on what's taking place. There are conditions that have been created for people to act out. And, and when I was there, and you know, we were on RNDC and I, I visited all the units as well, and we're talking to you know, 15 young kids um, who were saying, you know, I just need to get to the law library. That's all I'm trying to do, Julio. But I've been in my cell for the last 10 days. I haven't showered in seven of those 10 days. Um, and when you create conditions where people become explosive, I think it's important that that be addressed as well. Uh, even prior to thinking about, okay, how do we get health and hospitals, how we get everybody else on board, you know, uh, again, in my visit, someone not taking the, the, the schizophrenic uh, uh, medication since September 1 is unacceptable. It doesn't matter if there's, there's one 
uh, person that, from Health and Hospitals that's working. There's, it, there's absolutely, uh, for someone not to have that medication, uh, I think it's troubling. But more importantly, uh, what I'm seeing, council members, is some conditions that are happening that unfortunately we, uh, we are resulting in violent behavior. Um, I think if we can address those immediate conditions, we can see some of those changes happening as well. Great, thank you. Thanks, Chair Cogwitz. Thank you, Councilmember Powers. We'll now hear from Councilmember Adams. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Medina. Welcome. Thank you. Um, and you and I did chat yesterday, and I thank you for taking my call. Um, I express to you that I have particular interest in this um, in this appointment um, because of my background with commission. I believe I explained to you my mother was a retired captain in correction, and the issue surrounding the current state of correction is very, very personal to me. Um, so I'll just ask a, a broader a broader question. Due to the current crisis on Rikers Island right now, some of my colleagues in government, um, other than this body, feel that all detainees should be released immediately. Others feel that the jail should be closed immediately so that the shift to borough-based jails can take place even sooner. In your estimation, is there any hope for the successful operation of Rikers Island at this point? I'm the full optimist, so yes. Um, I believe if we can get uh, people back in, uh, I believe if, if uh, some of those basic needs are met, we can at least begin to de-escalate so much that's happening now. And again, just, just being there uh, uh, again Tuesday and getting a report yesterday on some of the conditions that are saying um, Julio, we, we are just looking for uh, white paper to write a letter out of the facility. Um, I think can make a difference as we begin to look at smaller, safer jails. I was part of the Lipman Commission. Uh, we did a lot of that work. I believe smaller and safer jails can be the answer. Uh, I think we also have to look at our culture um, and begin to look at how do we change a culture, one that at one point existed around systematic violence to now something can be very productive and rehabilitative. Um, so to answer your question, uh, yes, I, I do believe that we could sustain Rikers if there's a lot of changes immediately um, until the smaller, safer borough-based jails are built. If you had the ability to make those decisions right now, today, mm -hmm. and I believe my colleague used the expression uh, wave a magic wand. Come on, give me that wand. <laughs> if, you, if you had the ability to wave that magic wand right now over this facility that I consider a hellhole, to tell you the truth, what would your top three uh, solutions be in, in priority to, uh, to rid ourselves of the, uh, the horror, the death, the disease, the, the lack of discipline, you name it, the, uh, the gang housing, uh, I could go on and on. But let's just give us three. What would your top three solutions be? Sure, uh, solution one is we, we have to get correction officers back in the facility to work. Um, they are needed at this point, movement, nothing is happening. Uh, I had a crew in there yesterday. They waited uh, 15 minutes right at the bubble to try to get out. They couldn't get out, fight broke out. Uh, some of my team got maced. So I think the first thing would be how do we get correction officers back to work? Uh, uh, point two is, is we have to get innovative programming back onto Rikers Island. Uh, people are desperate for an opportunity to do something different with their lives. Again, I was in RMDC, uh, C-74, 18 to 21 year olds. We met with about 15 Crips. Uh, the only reason we can meet with Crips, as you know, is because the houses are, uh, are all separated. They're all gang, different gang houses. They want the same thing everybody else wants. 
right? Julio, I need a law library. Julio, I need books to read. Julio, I need a Bible. I mean, we're talking about some basics. So the first, uh, uh, point two is definitely get some programs in there, some innovative stuff, uh, so people are feeling their humanitarian spirit once again. Rikers Island should not be a place of horror, but should be a place where people kind of, you know, get an opportunity to reflect, figure out what they did wrong, and become re a rehabilitative model, not only for New York City, but for the country. So I think that's uh, uh, two is how do we get programs back in. Um, and three, this has to be some complete transparency and accountability, right? So let's stop pointing fingers at it's this person's fault, it's this person's fault. I think as a community, we failed our justice system. Our justice system should be rehabilitative. Our justice system should talk about this young kid who committed a crime at 17 years old, at 18 years old, should be able to get a second chance. And we have to be able to look at it through that lens as, as, a, as people that, that, at least New York, I believe, should be leading the country when we think about justice. But to have an eyesore as Rikers Island, as some of the, the horror stories that we're hearing, doesn't fit with our progressive kind of ideology that we bring from, from New York City. So those will be the top three things, thank you. Thank you, uh, I wouldn't disagree with anything that you said at all. I might add uh, COVID testing. Yes. Um, upon entry and release. Mm -hmm. um, and um, possible um, vaccination uh, mandating, but that we'll, we won't even mention that word mandate right now. So, um, <laughs> but thank you very much for your answers. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Merritt, if I may, uh, as chair of public safety uh, and having oversight over the NYPD and CCRB, I welcome you um, to, this, uh, to this hearing this morning. Just a couple of questions for you. Uh, I'm sure that you are aware of the discipline matrix for NYPD. Yes. What are your thoughts on the discipline matrix for NYPD as it relates to the CCRB? I'm hoping that it'll be reformed with the new administration in 2022. Uh, the CCRB should have more teeth and be able to make recommendations that mean something. When you look at the small percentages of cases that move forward, uh, some people feel it's worthless. You don't. It, it's not good enough. I've, I've heard the word toothless used about CCRB. But I know that every change is important. The small changes sometimes can have a ripple effect. And as more, a, 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 with public relations, as I said before, transparency and accountability, I think that it'll make a big difference if the CCRB is allowed to have some teeth in what they do. I would definitely agree with you there. Um, I'll also uh, ask you your feelings on this because some people do feel that the CCRB should be an elected body um, instead of an appointed body. So what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I've had a lot of experience since working in elections. And if you wanna have a, re you have a better chance of getting a represented body by having good council people appoint people they know can do the job than election because with elections come money, comes political support, and you're not gonna get the person that's possibly on the ground that knows, knows what's most important. I, I don't think that elections would solve that problem. Okay, thank you for your thoughts. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Council Member Adams. We'll now hear from Council Member Chen. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for uh, Mr. Medina. How are you? Wonderful. Thank I mean, you. looking, congratulations on your nomination. I mean, looking at your personal and professional experience, um, I think you will be able to add a lot to the uh, New York City Board of Correction. Thank you. And really work on some of the horrible, horrible you know, problem that we've been seeing right now on Rikers Island. Um, and I think from your experience, I know that you did mention the borough-based jail. And in the council, we worked very hard to get that passed. And especially in my district, I had to overcome a lot of opposition because we truly believe that that is the way to go, to really give uh, the detainee 
an opportunity um, to get support and, and, and be able to go back into society and make their contribution. So maybe you could elaborate a little bit more in terms of how do you see, you know, going forward, uh, having, you know, smaller borough-based jails that are safer to really help, you know, mitigate some of the, you know, really serious and unfortunate, you know, incident that we're seeing right now in Rikers and why it needs to be closed. Wonderful. And thank you so much for all, all of your support around uh, smaller, safer jails and let me commission's recommendations. Um, so we, I was part of the, the culture committee on, on both the mayor's task force and, and on the Lipman Commission. I think one of the things that when we think about smaller, safer jails that are under 1,000 people that will be in four of the boroughs, um, we can really look at how do we specifically become very transparent, work in small modules, so we're working with, with, with people on an individual basis, um, and get some of this work done where people are really looking for this second chance. So, the way the design alone, um, as you all know, doesn't feel like a prison. You're, you're walking into a regular building and, and it feels good and, and the courts is, is right next door so it saves everyone's time. It, there's not a lot of travel going to the one courtroom from Rikers Island. People are right in their districts. Families can visit so now you remain connected to the person. You know, it's really difficult around visits when you have to go across one, you know, tiny bridge uh, uh, to get to Rikers Island and you know, you're coming from a, a different borough. So I think you know, when we think about visitation, when we think about some of the programs that were created, that we, we are creating uh, to go into the smaller, safer jails, when we think about the design uh, being an educational design, being a design that's transformative, that thinks about second chances, that's taking all of this into consideration, I think we can really lower our, our jail population we can make our city safer. Of course, there'll be a small percentage of folk that, that, you know, this unfortunately we probably can't reach, but I think our statistics as a city will be so much greater and, and we'll have a rehabilitative model in place with smaller, safer jails. I know it carries a hefty price tag, but I believe the numbers said, you know, in 10 years we'll be able to recoup and we end up saving actually in the long run. Great, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Chin. We'll now hear from Councilmember Rose, followed by Councilmembers Traeger and Drum. Thank you. Um, I have uh, just one question for um, for Mr. Merritt. Um, uh, your your reputation precedes you, you know, here today as a stellar and engaged educator, um, and I um, I'm really concerned about um, how you would go about getting the public to know or understand or be better informed about the function of the CCRB. Um, I have a CCRB, um, uh, I make arrangements to have CCRB in my district uh, once a month and, um, and we advertise it every week in my e-blast. I rarely get anyone, you know, to come. And what I hear is, is that um, they really don't know about the CCRB or its function. Council Member Adams and I fought really hard to get additional funding in the budget this year for um, community education and community engagement. And, um, and when I watch the CCRB proceedings, um, often at every, every meeting, there are people there that say, I didn't know about the CCRB. I don't know what the CCRB does. And that's really distressing to me because of the high incidence of um, community police uh, incidents that, you know, we, we see in, in New York City. So, um, how is it or how do you think that we could better inform the, the community about the CCRB and, um, and its functions? Thank you. I, I hear you saying that you have these hearings in your, or these meetings in your, in your district every month. Uh, that's just an ancillary thing. We just make, um, we, we try to make it convenient 
for people because, as you know, Staten Island is not uh, <laughs> one of the uh, boroughs that people are flocking to. But we have an arrangement with the CCRB to, um, to provide services to my constituents at least once a month. And, um, and the problem is, is that people don't come because they don't know or understand the function of the CCRB. Although we um, advertise it every week in my weekly um, e-blast and that the service is available. And then when I watch or participate in the monthly board meetings of the CCRB, people are always, there's always people who, who open their remarks with, I did not know about the CCRB or I don't know what they did. And so I want to know, you know, what can we do with all the efforts that we've made to, you know, to better inform the public about CCRB and its functions? Well, well simply, we just can't give up. We have to try new, new methods and avenues. You have to, churches, uh, young people. I, I was particularly impressed when I read a lot about the YAC, the Youth Advisory Council. I believe there are only 19 throughout the city, 19 students who are involved. But it seems that if they were, if, if we could expand that and have more young people talking about it, that would make a difference. In terms of uh, adults being involved, I don't know. But in terms of young people not having this negative view of police officers, people you know, want police out of the schools. Well, police have to be in the schools just to learn kids and kids to learn them so, so that, the, that the, the children don't look at police officers as people on the other side. The more interaction you have with police officers and citizens and their positive interactions, things begin to change. Uh, I think that we success stories of the CCRB, when people make a complaint and they feel that their, their, their complaint was heard, people, those things have to go out. L looking at the uh, commercials, uh, they do these commercials every day about the uh, vaccinations. And you hear people telling their testimonial about, I didn't want to, to the vaccine, I had to take, I took it, and it works, please do it. You know, maybe if we had that kind of PR campaign of somebody that went to the CCRB and how it worked for them. Um, I know that this couldn't be done, but I think it works the other way too, when police officers are, when it's not, when a charge is not substantiated, you know, they will believe that, oh, this works, you know, if you're, it works for both, both sides. I would just appreciate if you would um, advocate for a robust public campaign, uh, public education campaign. Um, and I do believe that that means um, advertisement and, and posters and things on public conveyances and so that people in New York City actually know that they have an advocate or an agency by which to go to um, to address those issues. I want to see a more aggressive outreach and education, um, you know, effort made. And so uh, I'd like for you to take that challenge on um, if you're appointed to this board. Okay. I, I agree with you, Councilwoman, and I promise that I will. Uh, we'll now have questioning from Councilmember Traeger. Thank you. I, I just uh, want to speak very briefly in, uh, in support and, and also appreciation for Mr. Merritt, who I've known for a number of years. And you know, uh, I, I, many folks who know me know I am I'm also a former educator, but Mr. Merritt went on to be a principal and a great leader in, in labor as well. Um, I, I actually think this makes sense on many levels. Uh, Mr. Merritt, who was at a time a principal, was actually in charge of the safety 
of students and staff in, in a school building. And he has always seen this issue through a lens holistically, which I actually think we need a lot, whole lot more of. Um, very much familiar with procedures, while also having to advance you know, instructional agendas in a school. I want to say that in my district, before my tenure, when there would be issues or meetings about public safety, it would be mainly just police and a precinct council. But during my tenure, I actually invited principals to meetings. I invited community-based organizations to meetings and other stakeholders and looked at the issue holistically. And we've actually been able to tackle many root issues that have been plaguing residents for many years. So I actually think educators and school leaders, particularly those who were actually responsible for safety day-to-day -day functions, bring a, a real interesting, unique skill set with fresh eyes and familiarity with procedures. And to my colleague's uh, point, Councilman Rowe's excellent point about public awareness campaign, I also would appreciate, you know, this is uh, my final year in the council, but I believe that more collaboration even with policymakers about things and cases that you see, that you come across, experiences you come across, to make recommendations. What can we do better? What more resources to communities are needed? What policy changes? We need to communicate and collaborate and get things done on behalf of the people we serve. So Mr. Merritt, I want to thank you for your leadership, for your partnership, uh, always looking at things through lens of equity, holistically meeting the needs of people, meeting them where they're at. And I am in full support and appreciation for your nomination. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you, Councilmember Traeger. And finally, we'll hear from Councilmember Drum. Thank you very much, uh, last but not least, and I want to thank the Chair for um, allowing me to speak, although I'm not actually part of this committee. Uh, I want to congratulate Herman Merritt as well, and I just want to uh, reiterate the kind words that uh, Chair Traeger said, uh, Chair of the Education Committee. I also, when I was Chair of the Education Committee, had the opportunity to work closely with you on many issues as they affected our public school system and deeply appreciate um, all of your support and the work that you've done. So uh, I congratulate you and support your nomination. I uh, want to thank uh, Jenny Lowe as well. I know her well. I worked with her closely here in the council, and I'm very supportive of your nomination as well. Uh, Dr. Kwan and Ms. Marthona don't know you, but uh, congratulations on your nominations and uh, good luck. Uh, and I do want to just uh, talk with Mr. Me Mr. Medina as well. Uh, I'm proud to have worked closely with the speaker to place your name in nomination for this position, uh, working along with the chair of the Criminal Justice Committee, uh, Keith Powers, as well. Um, I have heard uh, tremendous things about the work that you have done uh, with Exodus and with uh, the folks that um, come into the program there, and so that I think uh, because of your lived experience as having been formerly incarcerated also, having the voice of somebody who has been formerly incarcerated, who has been through the system, is really important to understanding the system and knowing what's going on. Uh, I was proud to support Stanley Richards. I know he's a friend of yours, and he highly recommended you for this position as well. Uh, so I'm, I'm thankful to Stanley for the work that he's done. He's now left the um, Board of Correction, and he has gone over to the administration and is doing a superb job there. Uh, and as well as Vinnie Chiraldi is also, and they have many challenges, but I do believe deeply in both of them. Um, one of the things that the advocates do bring up, and I, I heard what Council Member Powers was saying as well about the, um, the BOC plan regarding uh, punitive segregation, um, uh, you know, uh, and the implementation of their rules. I have legislation. Uh, before the City Council uh, in regard to punitive segregation. Um, it's a bill that uh, kind of reflects uh, what the BOC has done, but advocates are saying to me they would like to see more out of cell time. Um, it, you know, it currently is at about 10 hours of out of cell time. Uh, advocates are advocating for 14 hours, and I'm wondering if you could comment on what you feel is an appropriate amount of time to be out of cell. Sure. Uh, uh, thank you as well. And, and let me just say, you know, again, I, I, I was remiss in not talking about the leadership at Rikers Island that, that has changed with uh, the new commission of Vinnie Chiraldi, uh, Stanley Richards, his first dep, that I think could uh, 
part of my reason why I think Rikers could change. Actually, a large reason, a large part of my reason is because of the leadership and their uh, transformative approach to looking at changing some of the conditions. So I just wanted to, to, to start with that. Um, yeah, social isolation doesn't work. Uh, we all know that. I think you know, 14 hours, if not more, is, is, is fair uh, uh, amount of time so people can get out of their cells, so people can do things, so people can socially interact with each other. I think social interaction is a huge uh, just aspect of normalizing the conditions that one lives in when they're in Rikers Island. Um, I know there's been a, a kind of a lot of pushback back and forth. Uh, you know, no, we just have to become more creative in how we think about uh, uh, punishing young people who, who commit an infraction, who, who already are in jail, uh, and, and we're gonna even tighten it more by finding these restrictive measures. So um, yes, 14 hours would, would, would definitely be a step in the right direction. Um, again, I believe if, if, if we have some more creative programming and, and different orgs going in and, and, and really thinking creatively about what we can do, you know, one of the things that we're doing is we have a music studio and, you know, all these kids think they can rap. Uh, so what we've done was, you know, we have a Latin King, a Crip, a Blood, uh, yeah, every, every other little gang on the same song. Because if you can get on the same song together mm. and not kill each other, that's the first step in recognizing each other's humanity. So I think we have to just continue to think differently. And one day, probably, we can just do away with any form of restic restrictive segregation. And uh, I know you are highly regarded by uh, those who have been affected by uh, the justice system as well. And to hear you say that, I think, is really important for us all to take note of. Um, and I think you're right in terms of the programming. It really, really counts for the programming. Uh, when Keith, uh, excuse me, when Councilmember Powers and I visited uh, Rikers um, last week, actually, on Thursday, we saw the intake unit horror, like something out of the Middle Ages, literally horrible, horrible, probably the worst human rights abuses I've ever witnessed with my own eyes. I was so affected by it, I almost couldn't complete the visit there because it was just so overwhelming. Um, th but that being said, um, you know, these are people that are in need of, of help and, and deserve help and also have not, for the most part, except for those who are serving up to a year or so, been convicted of a crime yet. And I think that's something we have to take into account. We also visited the cells uh, that they're using for punitive segregation, which is a cell, an extended half of a cell, mm -hmm. which is not really acceptable either, but I think for right now is the best we can do at this point. But in the long run, hopefully we can correct that situation also. My last question is uh, really more to do with um, how do we change the culture uh, on Rikers Island? That, I think, is also key. How do we get to the corrections officers to understand um, that what we're trying to accomplish here is also going to make life better for them there? And if we can do that, I think that's where the real change will occur. Uh, uh, fully agree. I think, you know, uh, even when we were thinking about the smaller, safer jails and we're building the smaller jails, you know, we don't want to create four small Rikers Islands, right? The goal is to, again, be transformative in our approach. And I do, do think it begins with correction officers. I would love to see something in the training academy happen. I believe 600 officers are going through the academy as we speak. I think one of the things we do is what, what are the trainings that are happening, right? These are community members, correction officers are neighbors, they are, they are. And what's happening in this process where the disconnect becomes us against them? This adversarial relationship that's been, that's been inherent in, in the criminal justice system for the last you know, 50 plus years, I think we have an opportunity to change with our smaller, safer jails. But some of those things have to happen collectively with, with COBA and the unions and, and really working together in a just transparent format to say, I can recognize the humanity in that person that's locked up, and that person can recognize the humanity in that officer that has a job to do and wants to go home safe to their families. I think those collective goals are gonna be important if we are to move uh, and begin to change the culture that, that right now, as you saw, as I saw, as the news is reporting daily, is inhumane, uh, and something needs to happen immediately. 
So thank you uh, for all that you've done thus far as well. It means a lot. Thank you, you know, and um, I, I think you're right. I think, um, you know, uh, what Stanley and, and, and Vinnie Schiraldi are focusing on uh, in, in many ways is also supporting those, those corrections officers, mm -hmm. giving them some extra support, you know, opening up a garden and a place to mm -hmm. eat and, you know, dealing with the overtime that they're, that they're, that they're being forced to do, et cetera. Um, and, and one of the things I think, and I think uh, uh, Chair Powers would agree with me, that I felt at this visit, because I've been visiting for almost 12 years at Rikers, um, but this time around, I felt there was um, more transparency. And I think that that came because the leadership is saying, tell the real deal, mm -hmm. tell us what's really happening here. Because in my conversations with both the corrections officers and with uh, the medical staff, the doctors and the nurses there, I felt that they were really giving us the, the information we needed as a council to be able to support the change that's needed to, to change that culture in Rikers Island. So thank you for coming in. Thank you for your uh, leadership. Thank you for what you've done at Exodus. And I look forward to continuing to support your, your uh, nomination uh, to the board. Thank Congratulations. you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Drum. Uh, we will now move to the Board of Health and the Health and Hospitals Corporation. First, we will consider the nomination of Simona Kwan to the Board of Health. The primary function of the Board of Health is to legislate and oversee the New York City Health Code, which encompasses the rules governing all matters and subjects within the jurisdiction of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. The Department of Health's jurisdiction is among the most extensive and varied of all of the city agencies from communicable diseases and mental health to food safety and even veterinary affairs. The fact that the health code rules have the force and effect of law and cover such an extensive range of measures aimed at improving the physical and mental well-being of New Yorkers highlights the importance of the work of the Board of Health and consequently the vital need for crucial consideration of all potential appointees. The Board of Health's 11 members serve six-year terms without pay and cannot be dismissed without cause. Simona Kwan's name has been submitted by the mayor for appointment to a vacancy on the Board of Health. If she receives the advice and consent of the council, she will be eligible to serve the remainder of a six-year term that expires on May 31st, 2022. Next, we will be considering Patricia Marthone for the Health and Hospitals Corporation. HHC is a public benefit corporation charged with the duty of providing high quality, dignified, and comprehensive health care and treatment to the public, especially to those who cannot afford such services. The Health and Hospitals Corporation Board of Directors consists of 16 members. Included within the board's membership, in addition to five ex officio members, are 10 appointees of the mayor, five of whom are designated by the council for consideration by the mayor. The term of office for directors is five years, with a vacancy filled under the terms of the original appointment. Directors are not compensated, but are reimbursed for actual expenses. Patricia Marthone, a resident of Kings County, is a candidate for designation and subsequent appointment by the mayor to health and hospitals. Her appointment is contingent on receiving clearance by the Conflicts of Interest Board. If appointed, Patricia Marthone will fill a vacancy and serve the remainder of a five-year term that will expire on March 20th, 2023. Welcome to the candidates. Would you both please raise your right hands to be sworn in? Do you both swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Uh, first, Simona Kwan, do you wish to make an opening statement? Good afternoon, I'm Dr. Simona Kwan. Thank you to Chair Kofowitz and the members of the Rules Committee for considering my nomination to the Board of Health. I'm a health disparities and health equity public health researcher at the NYU Grossman School of Medicine in the Department of Population Health, Section for Health Equity. My ties to New York City are deep 
I've lived in the city since 1997 with a three-year gap when I was at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore doing my postdoctoral fellowship. My parents immigrated to the U.S. from South Korea, landing in New York City in 1972. During that period, my father completed his fellowship and training in child and adolescent psychiatry at Brookdale Hospital in Brooklyn and practiced for several years at the New York City Children's Center in Jamaica, Queens. I earned my doctorate at the Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health with a focus on examining health disparities in communities who are medically underserved. Since 1997, I have worked on engaging community leaders and community-based organizations in the city to collaboratively develop and implement meaningful and sustainable health promotion and disease prevention programs and strategies within community settings with a focus on racial, ethnic minority and immigrant populations. While at Columbia University, I directed the New York site of a National Cancer Institute Special Populations Network project funded in 2000 to engage Asian American immigrants through community partnerships to promote cancer awareness research and training. This was one of the first initiatives in New York City focused on building a pan-Asian American coalition to advance health outcomes. And during that time, I helped establish one of the first Asian American health conferences in the city, bringing together community organizations, health centers, healthcare providers, and academic researchers, and developed and oversaw a coalition representing over 10 local Asian American serving community-based organizations across the city, inclusive of larger social service groups and smaller issue-specific organizations. Upon completing my doctorate, I accepted a postdoctoral fellowship at Johns Hopkins in the School of uh, Public Health to advance scholarship in community-based participatory research. CBPR is a partnership approach to research that equitably engages community members in a collaborative process, recognizes the unique strengths that each brings to advance social change and improve community health and eliminate health disparities. CBPR and coalition building across communities and stakeholder groups is the foundation of my research to examine health disparities and implement meaningful, culturally adapted, evidence-based strategies and programs into policy and practice to ensure reach to all populations, with a focus on groups that are socially and economically marginalized, including racial ethnic minority communities, immigrant communities, and limited English proficient populations. Currently, I am an associate professor in the Department of Population Health. I serve as associate director for the section for health equity, and I lead or co-lead the community engagement and outreach cores for several National Institute of, Institutes of Health Center grants, working to develop sustainable and bi-directional partnerships with under-resourced communities to advance inclusion and representation of all communities in research and the translation of research into policy and practice. I can't think of a higher calling than to serve the public as a member of the New York City Board of Health to apply best practices for inclusive engagement and outreach of all communities and evidence-based strategies translated into practice to advance health equity for all New Yorkers. Thank you for this opportunity and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Ms. Marthone, would you like to make an opening statement? Yes. Is it on? Can you hear me? Okay. Good afternoon, Chair and Council Members. I am grateful for this opportunity to come before you today and I don't wish to repeat my CV. Rather, with great humility and vulnerability, I want to share why I want to serve as a board member for New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation, h and &H. I earned a medical doctorate degree, Muter, from Charles University and have spent most of my life volunteering for marginalized populations and taking on responsibilities to care for others. I am one of four children, 
married, raised two children, cared for my elderly mother and two aunts in this great city that never sleeps, that grows our dreams, that respects our differences, and that strives to care for us all. Yet, when I closed my eyes on Wednesday night, I would hear a visitor rummaging through my recycling bins on the curb. One night, I met a middle-aged black man toting his life in a shopping cart, clothes tattered and disheveled hair, searching through our recycling. When his face came through the light, I was convinced I was staring at my father. I said, good evening, sir, and he completely ignored my call. His indifference and the way he pulled his cart back and walked off deepened my resolve to uncover whether his was a case of homelessness, mental illness, or addiction gone awry. He didn't afford me another opportunity to engage him, though I was ready to put him in touch with the right services through h and and New York City with referrals to community outreach programs. As a child, I heard that my father roamed the streets for a while with his paranoid schizophrenia. And though this man was not my father, he could be someone else's or their brother, or son, or be alone in this world. I would be negligent not to mention that as a daughter of immigrants that left the island of Haiti seeking the American dream, how appalling it is to learn that others are being denied the right to dream. Monday's inhumane images from Texas resembles pictures from southern slavery. The Department of Homeland Security was enforcing racist public health policies for COVID-19 on Haitians waiting to apply for, po for political asylum. Should they survive yet another nightmare, they will need trauma counseling and health care. Emma Lazarus wrote, it best on the Statue of Liberty that lives in the waters surrounding our great city. In the new Colossus, the last line reads, I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Their journey will be well met to find themselves become New Yorkers because we have H&H &H that can provide them with these services and a New York City that can help restore their dreams. I have a deep-rooted belief that healthcare is a human right, and when offered appropriately, should be culturally competent, have no barriers to timelessness and affordability. Timeliness, forgive me, and affordability. Be of gold standards, and most importantly, provided with dignity. H and H is where social determinants of health meet the biopsychosocial model in providing care for New York City. And it would be a privilege for me to safeguard and to serve our New York City as a board member of h, &H. Thank you for your time. I will now ask a few questions. Dr. Korn, what public health approach would you recommend to address ongoing vaccine hesitancy? Thank you for that important question. Um, vaccine hesitancy is uh, something that we're continuing to see across communities, and there is- um, Can you talk a little closer oh, to the mic? Sure, Thank sorry. You. Maybe I should take it off too. Um, Vaccine hesitancy, we have evidence-based tools and strategies to impact vaccine hesitancy. We need to target and tailor messaging. There are already strong efforts in place to create community partnerships with trusted community leaders and community-based organizations. These are groups that are 
embedded in communities. They are trusted by communities for language, for English, uh, limited English proficient populations. They are already doing the work of translating and getting information out to these populations. I would like to see formal, much more formal partnerships um, with these community networks that are already serving in this role, often in informal ways. Um, there are ways to amplify those, uh, those relationships, to provide resources and continuing support to them, and to really make sure that these, um, these strategies and tools that are being developed at the city agency level are really making it um, to all communities. Do you support the vaccine mandates? I, I, I think that there are very strong uh, multi-level strategies in place for addressing COVID. I think that vaccines are the backbone of that. I, I do understand though um, that there is still uh, communities that may not be being reached by all the information that they need. And I think that there is uh, an opportunity to look at and monitor and track how we're doing on existing guidelines and policies, identify with a health equity lens communities that we are missing if there are gaps in enforcement and how to strengthen those, those um, enforcements of existing strategies and also room to really um, suggest and recommend innovative, equitable strategies to help amplify and reach communities. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Martha, COVID-19 has highlighted longstanding health inequities within our city. How would you take like to see the city better address the health needs of the most marginalized New Yorkers? Thank you for that question. I think it would be great to see New York City have specialty clinics to support those that are ma marginalized. Often it is very difficult to even keep a doctor's appointment. And once you're there, it's very important to capture especially a long hauler and allow for them to receive any extended care that they might need. Um, it, it, and sometimes it means not only giving them the referral and making sure they leave with all the documentation that they need so that they can carry out that, carry out that referral and speeding up the process so that the appointment can happen soon, but it might also mean having just a clinic next door that specializes and brings all of those individuals together, all those specialists together, or have a primary, primary care provider that specializes or deals with just all the things that surround or that you see with COVID specifically. Thank you. And what other steps could health and hospitals take to help address mental health and mental illness issues in New York City? I'm sorry, can you say that again, ma'am? Hmm? I did not hear you. What other steps could health and hospitals take to help address mental health and mental illness issues in New York City? Oh. So, uh, mental health. Uh, I've seen a lot done with mental health in New York. Uh, and I'm proud to say that they've come a very long way from the days of when, for example, Kings County was infamously known for uh, patients in the waiting room not being cared for. Uh, that's not the same Kings County anymore. They have great CPAP, which is a psychiatric emergency room, and there's a lot of things that are done right now to even fill the gap, including New York City well. I think we're doing an excellent job in trying to attack it. But keeping providers is a problem. Having counselors is a problem. Not having enough people to provide the services is an issue for New York. We have a huge population. So we definitely need to make sure that we can have the funding to continue these services. Additionally, out of some of the great things that we've put in place to help individuals with, with psychiatric and psychological issues, uh, you will find that uh, they might not be able to offer them all day long. There's now a mobile unit that could be called to go to people's homes, for example, or wherever the crisis is happening to help them. It runs from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., Monday, Monday through Sunday. So every day of the year, however, 
from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m., they're not available. And if anybody has ever dealt with anybody who's in a crisis, you would know half the battle is getting them to leave where they are and get to an emergency room or where the care can be provided. And that mobile unit ha can, may have physicians on it, nurses, counselors. So those are the kind of things that we really need to, to provide our marginalized communities with where you bring the care to them. Others can afford to have that brought to their doorstep. We need to make sure that we can continue to do better with those things. And sometimes it takes more funding. Thank you. Thank you. I would like now to open it to uh, my colleagues for any questions. Um, Council Member Cheney. Thank you, Chair. Um, first, I want to congratulate both of you uh, on your nomination, uh, especially with uh, Dr. Simona Kwan. I, I had the uh, pleasure of working with you before I joined the council. And I think that the experience that you will be able to bring to the Board of Health uh, would be tremendous. And I think all the research that and you have done with the Asian American and immigrant community that would really uh, help us in terms of gain more access uh, to quality health care services. My question is that, uh, you know, the Asian American community, immigrant community, it's just so diverse. But it's still the issue uh, right now, like with mental health wellness. Like how do you see in terms of the role uh, in Board of Health to be able to have create more access for mental health services uh, for the immigrant population? I think that um, especially with the impact we're gonna see of COVID, that mental health and well-being is going to be an even more of a challenge and something that we need to address. There are really good evidence-informed, data-driven, community-based strategies that we can implement um, that will address certain language um, challenges around access. We need to engage our very strong community partners, um, community centers. Uh, there are programs where we can train lay health workers to be that front line. They're already in the communities and can serve as a very strong bridge to clinic settings. So really investing in that community clinic, clinic li linkage, either through recognizing the role of lay health workers or community health workers as part of a healthcare team, embedding them in these community settings and co-locating services within community settings, I think is really gonna be important to reaching all New Yorkers and using an equity lens to, um, to really address what we are seeing already um, that's gonna just continue to be amplified. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Matoni, uh, congratulations also. Uh, you know, HAC is such an important um, institution in our community, the facility, and, and I think with this administration, they have put in a lot more support. And so my question to you is that, how, being on the board of HAC, how do you see in terms of creating more opportunity for access to healthcare, like more neighborhood, you know, health center, having services from HHC within our schools, within our senior center, especially on this mental health wellness issue. And in your testimony, you talk about, you know, homeless. And right now, the majority of the homeless population have this mental health, you know, wellness issue. And so how do we make it more accessible so that people can access the service? Uh, I know in HHC in the past, they had crisis mobile van that can go into the neighborhood with professionals that can help individuals. So how do you see in terms of your role um, on the board of HEC to make this possible? Thank you for that question, Council Member Chen. You know, I often do think about that individual that I spoke about uh, because for me, it is very hard to put a stopgap measure in place for someone that, one, you don't know, you don't know where they live, they're not living in the same place all the time, um, and trying to figure out how best to facilitate 
making sure that there's always care available to them or that they know how to access care. And if we've been telling people where care exactly. might exist and they're not showing up, then ultimately we have to go to where we know they are. I've seen people go around the city on trains before, speaking to homeless individuals. You know, we have a whole homeless unit and they can also be part of the process on engaging these individuals on the care that's available to, to them. So, I mean, I, in, in, in the schools, we've done a decent job on that, on making sure that uh, parents have an idea that there's other types of healthcare available. And even one of the questions that we prov that's provided on the blue cards or the green cards every year is, do you have health insurance? Right, that's one of the things, the first things that's asked on those, on those cards, you know. Um, so we do do some things to try to figure out where it, it is needed, and I think we need to just go back, go, go back over and look at every single location in the community where we wanna make sure we fill those gaps and try to make sure that we are putting resources there to help make sure that they know where to find us. I have to tell you, I get a lot of phone calls from people asking about mental health. They do not know that HHC or New York City provide the services they provide. When I tell them, take your child to Kings County Hospital, they're like, you gotta be kidding me. And I'm like, absolutely. It, it is an awesome experience. And I, you know, using that word awesome for something like that, People, would, when you have a child in a, a psychological or psychiatric crisis, you're thinking, why would I take them to Kings County? And when I start to explain what the process is there, where, where they have them now, how they're located, people are shocked. And they did not know that this exists in their own neighborhoods. So I agree we have to do better, but not only word of mouth, we have to look at where the resources need to start from, where people need them, and start educating people from the outside, even using CBOs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Council Member Traeger. Thank you, Chair. Um, and I, I also, again, congratulate all of the nominees today. I just want to also particularly give thanks and appreciation uh, to uh, Dr. Marthone. Um, someone with an incredibly strong health background, uh, and I'm going to again underscore the equity lens. Um, and an issue that, and I, I'm, I, I'm going to keep saying this, uh, our public hospital systems don't get enough credit, uh, particularly in the moment that we're in, when it was impossible to get a vaccine appointment in, in my district, in my part of town, and I'm sure in other parts of the city, it was Coney Island Hospital that stepped up and proactively helped many people break down language barriers, also, there were seniors who could not wait until 2 in the morning to search for vaccine appointments online. So they went directly to the community, they broke down those barriers, and they helped save thousands and thousands of lives, and they still do that every day. They don't get enough credit for it. The issue that I've also helped tackle during my tenure in the council is the issue of, of staff retention. Um, I learned, for example, during a budget meeting with the hospital that they were requesting certain robotic surgery technology that would modernize their uh, surgery rooms, but would also have the effect of attracting and keeping medical students coming out of schools where they're training in medical schools with this modern technology but when they come, in, come into our hospital system, we're using stuff from the 80s. And we lose them to the private sector. And I, again, want to underscore the word equity, that regardless of what zip code you're from, where neighborhood you live in, you deserve the very best. And our public hospitals open their doors to everyone. Everyone. And so I, of course, work with, and, and thank you, Speaker Johnson, we secured money to get state-of-the-art technology, but it shouldn't be that way. This should be standard. This should be the norm. And so that is going to actually help them not just modernize, improve outcomes, but also help attract and retain 
uh, staff that's needed from medical schools. And so I'd like to hear your thoughts about what other ways can we do to make sure that we level the playing field and help address the issue of equity and address disparate healthcare outcomes that we saw even prior to the pandemic that certainly has been exacerbated by this pandemic. And I again, thank you and congratulate you on your nomination, Dr. Marthone. Thank you so much. Thank you for that question, Council Member Traeger. So, oh, wow, that, that's a two-part question. So l allow me to start with uh, recruiting medical students. Even after COVID, it's difficult to get people to consider going into medicine nowadays. It was a big turnoff. They started pulling people in their third and fourth year uh, to, you know, they ended medical school early to come and help in the hospitals and the experience alone turned some people off. So one that has to be addressed in the, f you know, in the future that to really ensure people that this is not what medicine looks like, especially if that was your first experience in a place like New York City where we were devastated by COVID in the, in the middle of the crisis, right? Um, two, I, I think it's important in training that you have both types of training, right? Because you never know when you will and will not have the equipment. And if COVID has not taught us anything, that is an excellent example of not having equipment available to you and positioning people instead of relying solely on equipment that was coming but didn't get here when it got here, couldn't be used, et cetera, right? So there does need to be a combination of that. So I don't think altogether that's just the only answer, the technology, but I do believe that we do need to put money into modernizing where we, where we feel we can keep people recruited um, in the future of New York City. And don't allow the brain drain that happens in New York to happen too much. Uh, I actually started in this statement writing about how I speak to so many professionals about coming back to New York, people that I grew up with constantly. I'm like, you need to come back. You need to come back to our communities and you need to work here. And I think we should not allow brain drain to happen and we should try to make sure we keep people invested in places they grew up because they're culturally competent in a lot of times and they might speak the language, right, of the community. So I think those are some very important things that we should keep in mind. I think the state had the right idea with Excelsior and some of the other funding things that they wanted to do, um, where if you earn if you earn up to like 100 or 115 or 125,000 a year as a parent, then your child doesn't have to pay, but the child has to stay in New York. It's something to that effect. But we need to get create even more creative around medical school in that aspect because we really need to bring healthcare providers back and keep them here, incentivized to stay here. I do not remember what the second question was. <laughs> I, I think you actually helped tackle a whole bunch of questions okay. uh, with that great answer. And thank you again. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Council Member Rose. Thank you. Um, both, uh, both of your um, credentials are, are very impressive. So I don't really have a, a question. I just have... Um, a general statement that I want to I want to call your attention to uh, we both we all know that the COVID pandemic you know laid bare multiple health care disparities and inequities um, and we know that there is really a crisis in New York City in terms of maternal health care and mental health and um, I'm asking that um, both of you no. Um, view your your task through an equity lens. Um, cultural competency is extremely important, okay. um, especially in these communities that are marginalized, uh, under-resourced, um, or no resources. Um, and so I, I find it important to me that appointees approach, you know, uh, the goals of both of these very important healthcare care um, agencies 
through an equity lens and, and one that recognizes that there are communities that are working from way behind, that the bar has never been equal uh, or the playing field has never been equal. Uh, I want to say uh, about H&H, &H, Staten Island still does not have an H&H &H, um, hospital. Uh, but we do have a Gotham, cent uh, a Gotham Health Center. And when there are these health issues that arise and H&H &H realizes that there's a need to uh, give more resources, to um, put more professionals, you know, on the ground, I would hope that Staten Island, in in lieu of the fact that we don't have a hospital, that our Gotham Center could be put into play in terms of providing those services. And I never want to see Staten Island again be the last place that has testing, uh, that has access to PPE. And um, I, I just want to make sure that that there, we're always there in that room. And it's really important because when the pandemic began, um, I had the hardest time trying to talk with the Department of Health, with H&H, &H about the lack of, of resources that we had on Staten Island because there is no city facility uh, that's recognized uh, in terms of mental, uh, of health. So uh, I just want to congratulate you, um, you both. Uh, you bring a wealth of experience to these positions. And I, I, I will gladly, you know, vote to confirm both of you, as I will all of the, um, the candidates here today. Uh, you're all to use the doctor's word, you're all awesome, and I, I think that you'll be um, wonderful candidates for us. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. I just, for on the record, want to uh, say the conflict of interest board. Okay, Dr. Mato. Thank you. Okay, um, I will now open up the floor to the public for comments. Comments to two minutes per person. Are there any members of the pu public pers present who wish to speak? Seeing none, I will now call on Billy Martin to take and announce the results of the vote. Okay. All right. William Martin, committee clerk, roll call vote committee on rules. All the items are coupled. Chair Kozlowitz. I want to congratulate everybody. I know that you will all do a very, very good job for us, keeping us healthy and helping us uh, in the correction department. And of course, our own Jenny, who will do a great job for the Board of Elections, I am sure. I vote aye. Chin. Congratulations again to all the nominees, and uh, I vote aye on all. Thanks. Rose. Congratulations, and I, I proudly vote aye on all. Traeger. Congratulations to all, I vote aye. Adams. I am so impressed by this group today. Thank you for hanging in there, uh, despite, in spite of the lateness and our questions. Uh, I proudly vote aye and congratulate each and every one of you. I vote aye on all. Powers. Very big congratulations to, to all of you, and thank you for being here today and answering our questions. And with that, I vote aye. Matteo. I'm voting yes on M327 and no on the rest. Thank you. Okay. 
Okay. By vote of oh, vote. Wait. We have, the speaker is coming up. want everyone to ask. So he wasn't sitting here. He was outside. <laughs> That's why I say they would have took care of me. Yeah. Thank you for your sharing. But it's not the first time I've seen your name. Oh, okay. No, I don't believe so. Speaker Johnson? I would I on all. Congratulations. M327 is adopted by the committee with a vote of eight in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions. And M326, 330, 331, and 332 are adopted by the committee with a vote of seven in the affirmative, one in the negative, and no abstentions. All items have been adopted, Madam Chair. Today's meeting of the Committee on Rules, Privileges, and Elections is hereby adjourned.